Imagine, 25 years from now, our collective world governments announce that the apocalypse is nigh. In a hundred years, the sun is going to expand, consuming the earth and the rest of the solar system. Meaning, not even Elon's little Mars project can save us. Desperate to save at least a few humans, Earth hatches a plan to strap 10,000 gigantic engines to the planet and jettison Earth from the solar system across the deep void of space so they can park her next to another another star, Proxima Centauri. Will we make it there alive? Are you seriously asking that? No, of course not. This is a space version of the Hunger Games. The question isn't whether you'll die, but how. In this video on Nerd Explains, I'll show you why you wouldn't survive the wandering Earth. Let's start with phase one, designing and building the engines. To get this wily e. Coyote plane on the road, a united Earth government is assembled to make critical decisions on humanity's behalf. Sure, because if world powers are good at anything, it's working together to make choices everyone agrees with that benefits all of mankind. It's the ultimate showdown. Does communism, socialism, or Team America take the reins? Let's go with uh, none of the above, as 195 dictators step forward to control, design, and build the Earth engines. Within days of the announcement of the catastrophic impending doom of Earth, they form a committee have some dorks scribble numbers on a napkin and converge on an idea they got from a sci-fi original. One that guarantees each of their family's spots in a limited vault tech vault, while the rest of us become meat popsicles working to death to keep them alive. Meanwhile, conspiracies on the internet reach a fever pitch as everyone becomes convinced this is a coup by gray aliens to eliminate the human race once and for all. Your weird uncle disappears into the hills and gun sales triple overnight. There's looting, and yes, even acts of cannibalism. My god, you've, you've actually seen people looting and eating each other. No, we haven't actually seen it, just reporting it. The death toll quickly reaches the hundreds of millions, of which you are certainly included. To power our planet out of the solar system, the government orders the construction of 10,000 Earth engines, each 11,000 meters tall, meaning each is 1,800 meters taller than Mount Everest. For comparison, the largest engine in the world now is the RT Flex 96C, which is 44 feet tall and 90 feet long. It's used to power cargo ships, and there are only 25 in the entire world, because it's expensive. Generation Films did us a solid calculating the construction materials needed to build one of these Earth engines. At 133 billion tons of concrete and 6.5 billion tons of steel rebar, it's a lot of zeros. To put that into perspective, every year approximately 16 million cement workers around the world produce around 4.1 billion tons. Just one of these engines would require all the concrete produced in 33 years, or 519 million workers doing nothing else but manufacturing concrete for one year, which means it would take them 10,000 years, which means they'd be dead because the earth will be consumed in 100 years. Now, if 5 billion people only produced concrete for the rest of their lives, it would still take over 1,000 years to produce enough to build 10,000 engines, and that's only one of many materials needed to build them. Sure, I guess I guess we could start mass manufacturing DARPA robot laborers to help, but robots require rare earth minerals to function. It takes all of five seconds to realize every resource wasted on robots can't be used to build the engines, so they send us serfs back to the mines immediately. And remember, these things are as tall or taller than Mount Everest. An engineering problem, to say the least. I sure hope nothing needs to be repaired at the top. Even if we could actually build all 10 10,000 Earth engines, we're all suddenly essential workers. Essential and expendable. In the wandering Earth, 3.5 billion, or nearly half of the world's population, has died before Earth even begins its journey. And we all know how. They slowly worked us to death, building the machines needed to keep everyone else alive. Or as I like to call it, the Earth Engine Gulags. The day after the Wandering Earth project is announced, schools become so 
sorting centers, a way of classifying workers into three categories, those with exceptional skills, those with scientific and engineering skills, and everybody else, probably you. Those with exceptional talent and rich connections are funneled into leadership positions, where they're trained to maintain civil peace, run things like food production centers and infrastructural systems, or replace the astronauts aboard the space station that's flying ahead of the Earth and doing a poor job of calling out obstacles in her path. Those who can be trusted to fix and design things are sent up into the engines themselves to maintain the machines the size of small countries. They swelter in the heat, go blind in the low light conditions, and succumb to radiation poisoning depending on what the engine's fuel source is. If you don't show a special necessary skill, you'll spend your entire life as a manual laborer toiling in the mines. Processing toxic substances, severe disabling injuries aren't a likelihood. They're guarantee. Soldiers with kill orders are dispatched to the engines to keep the peace. All that kumbaya propaganda the government's been pumping out about how we're all sacrificing for the survival of humanity works right up until the overpowered popo starts sending people in droves to the work camps. Because building the Mount Everest of machines 10,000 times over isn't enough. Under each of these rockets, underground cities are built to house the slave labor needed to keep the engines going throughout the journey, meaning even more mining for hazardous materials. And around this indentured workforce springs up entire separate industries needed to keep them alive. Food and beer production, medical care, and worst of all, involuntary parenthood. To keep a healthy replacement workforce in ready supply. I hope little Timmy likes drills and hammers, because those are the toys he gets to play with before he's conscripted into construction at the age of eight, or probably like six. All materials needed for things like infrastructure, building repair, car maintenance, and medical wizardry are rerouted to constructing the machinery needed to build and power the machines. The earth we're trying so desperately to save becomes a mined out, clapped out, polluted mess of cancerous runoff and factory smog. You die at the ripe old age of 42 with black lung. <laughs> I think I'm getting the black lung, Bob which means you're not around to buy a ticket to the global lottery. You know those underground cities I mentioned? Earth's government launches the largest propaganda-fueled PSYOP mission in human history to convince the engine surf builders that if they're good little simps, they'll get to be slave residents of the bunkers once we actually leave. Of course, there's zero chance that this lottery is actually random. It's rigged based on the value each surf will bring to the surviving population. And wouldn't you know it, very few worker ants are chosen for the Ark. With 10,000 cities, space and resources become rare commodities. Let's be outrageously generous and say they planned for each city to hold 100,000 people. That still drops the world population down even further to 1 billion. People start to realize real quick that the odds are not in their favor. Suddenly, access codes and key cards to the vaults are disappearing faster than a paycheck on payday. Blueprints schematic surface for unauthorized tunnels only the workers know about. Where the surfs are smart, they take over the engines with the precision timing needed to hold their engine hostage as Earth is knocked from its orbit. Where the surfs fail, they're killed in mass. This becomes a problem after Earth leaves, as the laborers were the ones who knew how to keep everything working. The underground cities now have to conscript and retrain the population they chose, creating a devastating lag in necessary services, resources, and infrastructural integrity. It's not all bad news. All the self-serving cronies die because they don't know how to replace a water filter. With everyone in place and the rest of humanity left to freeze or bake to death on the surface, the Earth engines turn on. Phase 2. Earth sets sail. We have to cement our status as a rogue planet by escaping our gravitational relationship to the moon. It's a precision maneuver we'll have to pull off at just the right moment, angle, and speed to avoid the moon colliding with us. They mark the occasion by wheel Tom Cruise out of his cryogenic chamber to give the propaganda address as we put our heads between our legs and kiss our goodbye. To control the movement of the planet, we have to stop the Earth's rotation. Say goodbye to the magnetic fields that keep out deadly UV radiation. On the side of the Earth facing the sun, there is no night. Temperatures spike, lakes and rivers boil, winds whip across the landscape. On the side of the planet facing empty space, there is no day, so temperatures plummet. The jarring new movement of the Earth sends tectonic plates crashing into one another, causing earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions. Just imagine all 
the destruction in that joke of a movie 2012, and you'll have a pretty good idea. As our atmosphere trails behind us like a comet's tail, breathing on the surface becomes impossible without supplemental oxygen. Without our moon, sea levels rise and tsunamis crash across the earth. Without our sun, plants and animals die. Average temperatures drop to negative 70 degrees Celsius while we're still in our solar system. Then, they plummet to negative 270 degrees while we travel between our star and the Alpha Centauri system, our future home. The entire journey to relocate our planet will take 4.4 light years, or 2,500 non-light years, which brings us to our next problem, fueling the engines. The movie mentions fusion technology powering the Earth engines. As the main character says, they're basically burning rocks. Yes, science! A bit of an oversimplification, but sure. Heating up elements until they transform into plasma, then ejecting them from the engines. For comparison, a single space shuttle launch burns 3.8 million pounds of fuel in a flight that lasts around 8 minutes. No amount of slave labor is going to be able to deliver the fuel needed to keep 10,000 engines going for 2,500 years, which means these engines have to be automatically funneling Earth into their tanks every moment of every day they're in operation. After watching this movie, one of NASA's senior engineers said that this process would consume between 85 to 95 percent of the Earth's mass just to get us to Alpha Centauri. It's like a cosmic practical joke passed down to your great times 100 grandkid. Enjoy living on a sliver of your former planet and all the possible devastation that could occur from that. And that's if the engines don't erode the ground around them and collapse or break down on the way, which they absolutely absolutely would. Mining equipment would freeze all the time. In the meantime, humanity is putt-putting around on Earth's frozen surface using thousands of trucks. As anyone who lives where the air hurts your face will tell you, engines don't like the cold or the vacuum of space. And batteries freeze at negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit. That's going to be a second strike for Elon Musk. Mars rovers use radioisotope heaters to stay warm at negative 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And only for years, maybe a decade or two. A far cry from two to three times colder and 150 to 250 times as long. Not to mention engineering a few small robots to withstand extreme temperatures that are relatively tame in comparison with the Wandering Earth projects doesn't mean we can do it on a planetary scale. Every time they have to be replaced, vital resources are being rerouted from the Earth's engines. Humanity is held hostage for millennia by shrinking manufacturing resources. The surface landscape is a minefield of buildings and debris under the ice. Crevices are common. Earthquakes shift the ice all the time. The resources needed to rescue transport trucks outweigh their value. So when you crash, you're either dying a slow, cold death or hoofing it to the nearest settlement. And if the helmet supplying your air cracks, you get to go blind as the frigid air freezes your eyeballs and ice crystallizes your lungs. Not to mention that all of these engines need oxygen to run. You know, that stuff trailing off the back of our planet it's like a coconut vape. On a wing and a prayer, we get on our way, carving a path through space, which means we now have to survive the journey. All that planetary torquing destroys cities and engines in the first weeks after we leave orbit. The United Earth government immediately dispatches rescue teams across the icy tsunami ravaged landscape, but not to save us poor peons. They're sent to repair and restart the damaged engines as soon as possible. Once the engines are operational, digs begin at the sites of ruined cities, but only to reopen them so more slave residents can be resettled there to keep the engines running and start up production on whatever that city produced for everyone else. Underground, essential services require dedicated workforces. Aquaponic farms allow us to maximize food production on a minimized footprint, but even at 200 square feet per person, each city needs a 460 acre farm to feed its population of 100,000 year round. That's if there's no no fungi, no pests, no disease, no issues with polluted water or fire. There is zero margin for air there, and no emotional eating to combat the existential dread filling your every waking moment. No Twinkies or Pineapple Express either. Why even survive at that point? My favorite part is the well-researched nutritional science solution for satiating a billion people over a 2,500-year-long journey through the darkness of space is devised not by nutritionists 
experts, not by dietitians or by doctors, nor anyone even remotely familiar with the human body's nutrient needs, but by biologists who decided to feed everyone earthworms. Why? Because you. That's why. Oh, but don't worry. I'm sure all the elites that have secured their spots in the penthouses of the Earth's engines are being fed nice juicy steaks. Really? It's because worms can live off farm scraps and create compost. And because 668 grams of earthworm bars a day will give us the 2,000 calories we need to survive our shitty existence. If we can get the scaling right, which is a big if. People trying to grow earthworms earthworms for food now can barely do it. And even if the worms work, by the time we reach Alpha Centauri, humankind will have devolved into a bunch of stage 5 brainless doomer wojacks. Or, if we're lucky, cannibals. Sanitation, clean air and water systems, electricity and heating must work perpetually for 2,500 years. Which means when Susan in accounting herself to death after a bad batch of earthworms, all humanity will be lost. City space becomes an issue. Humans don't actually need all that much to survive. Less than 400 square feet is the minimum sanitary quotient. But disease travels fast in tight spaces. The multi-step chemical processes for manufacturing basic pharmaceutical products is available in some of the better equipped cities, but not everywhere. Medicines with simpler formulas like aspirin are still producible, but in the absence of synthetic insulin, most people with type 1 diabetes die before their third birthday. And God help you if you have any other rare diseases. But good news, my hedonistic friends. New recreational drugs are in mass production before we even reach the asteroid belt. Even, or especially, if we're not high, boredom, cabin fever, loneliness, exhaustion, and grief drive us mental. Crime rates spike in cities most of us can't escape. As rationing and loss of luxuries start to take its toll, a black market springs up. Only for men rebellion further when the worker bees realize the rich are getting bigger rations and using precious medicines they brought for the trip. When an unelected leader gets on the laborer's bad side, or an unpopular law passes, revolt explodes in various cities. When the fighting ends, the losing side is forced into the worst sections of the underground cities, or just killed outright. Specialized workers and leaders get beheaded, costing everyone valuable information and experience. Without anyone still alive to pass that knowledge down to the next generation, skills and technology are lost forever. You know all those ancient alien people who claim Egypt had nukes 5,000 years Years ago, same flavor, different scenario. Along the way, we encounter our biggest obstacle yet, the Jupiter situation. We try to use Jupiter in a slingshot maneuver to propel us into deep space. This once in a millennia event goes spectacularly awry. We don't do enough prep, miss our window for the gravitational assist, and breach the Roche limit, which is the minimum distance a body can move around a planet before tidal forces threaten to tear it apart. In the movie, a ragtag team of heroes decide to ignite Jupiter. Since the gas giant is 90% hydrogen, they funnel the power from a single engine to its breaking point, then sacrifice the navigational space station to help their flame reach the planet's atmosphere. Sure, just uh, one big problem there. In order for hydrogen to blow, it needs to be mixed with half as much oxygen. To ignite Jupiter, like they say, it'd take more oxygen than exists in the entire solar system. Even if nothing goes wrong, and we slingshot around to Jupiter. We get to sizzle in the glow of her devastating radiation. Jupiter emits an amount of radiation equivalent to 100 million x-rays. Anyone else watch Chernobyl? I hope we all wanted extra legs for Christmas because we're getting nuked with 25 times the radiation of that disaster. All those techies working in the engines are so super dead. I hope we trained a replacement staff. <laughs> Who am I kidding? Of course we didn't. As we slip the surly bonds of Jupiter, we glide into the Lovecraftian emptiness between solar systems. Deep space is a nightmare. No one's coming to save us now, and there's no turning back. We aim for a target four light years away, which is the cowboy bebop equivalent of shooting a gun across the Atlantic Ocean and hitting a mosquito in Africa 40 times over. If the angle of the thrust from our engines is off by a fraction of a hair. We end up millions of kilometers off course at least. And let's not forget, we've lost our navigational space station. You know, the one looking out for giant space rocks in our way. It's like a big game of Galaga, except with a ship the size of a planet and no joystick to avoid 
avoid collisions. There's no wooden door big enough for all of us after we hit that iceberg. 700 years before we reach our new system, we have to frontside 180 the Earth like it's a skateboard so we can parallel park in Alpha Centauri's Goldilocks zone. Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't think I trust the science on this one. The Alpha Centauri system has two primary stars. The one we need, Alpha Centauri A, is sun-sized but has 1.5 times the brightness, so we gotta park farther away to avoid even more biblical destruction. But Alpha Centauri B also orbits A in an elliptical orbit, like a radioactive friend with boundary issues every 80 years. B is gonna scooch right in with skyrocketing temperature and sunlight levels, famines, boiling seas, and cancer waves. Don't forget our final maneuver as we roll into position around star A. We have to restart our rotation and tilt the Earth to gain back our seasons, our day and night cycles, and our wind and ocean currents. All the things that make life happen. But remember, we yeeted our moon before leaving. Without tides, there's no movement of water nutrients to feed sea life, which means red lobster lobsters a thing of the past. Tides also help with weather circulation and the movement of water pollution. Earth engines have been tossing out particulates of hazardous chemicals onto the ice that will become our drinking water. So we can look forward to fallout level mutations. There is no life straw big enough to slurp through the toxic sludge that 2,500 years of pollution causes. Not to mention the sheer amount of debris leaching who knows what into the water. New shifts of tectonic plates as the engines push and pull us into position trigger massive deadly earthquakes. Ice melts slowly across the planet. Some water pours back into the sea, but a whole a lot seeps down into the underground cities, destroying farms during the thaw, as well as the refrigeration of the embryos and seeds we need to repopulate the earth with animals and planets. Oh, yeah, and we used up all of our natural resources getting here. Guess it's back to building mud houses with asbestos water. The now derelict engines tower over us like weird skeletal spiders as our unyielding dictators send us to scavenge parts to repurpose into spaceships to steal resources from nearby planets. And we all die after someone tracks in an unknown microbe on their shoe or brings back one of these bad boys. To recap, there are a million reasons why you would not survive the Wandering Earth Project. You're nothing but disposable muscle and meat to your new global overlords. You're trapped in the orphan crushing machine that eats 5 billion people over a thousand years just to build the Earth engines. You are not special enough to be selected in the global vault tech lottery. When the Earth moves, you're crushed into red jelly by an earthquake or repurposed as fish food by a tsunami. When the Earth engines malfunction, your giblets burst like confetti in the result resulting explosions. You become an ice mummy while working on the surface when a pea-sized piece of shrapnel punctures your helmet and suit. You catch every disease trapped in close quarters or go insane in the empty void of space. You can't ignite Jupiter and Earth breaks apart in our atmosphere. Or we miscalculate our trajectory and never even reach Alpha Centauri at all. Let's just hope we never have to test the wandering Earth theory in the first place. I'd rather die when the sun engulfs the Earth, crushed in a rave while double-fisting margaritas. I'm I'm sure I've missed a bunch of reasons why you wouldn't survive the wandering earth, so let me know in the comments how you think you'd die.